It was a typical Friday afternoon at Milford High School, a school located in a small town centered in the cold depths of good old New Hampshire. The final bell had just rung, signaling the start of the weekend for most students. But for a select group of us that likes to dick around and distract everything that walked, the day was far from over. As the troublesome kids trudged down the classic hallway of the schools in school suspension detention room, the weight of their punishment seemed to hang heavy on their shoulders. There was an air of resignation among them, as if they knew they were in for a long and tedious afternoon. Inside the empty and poorly lit detention room, rows of desks faced an old-fashioned chalkboard and one of those classic projectors every kid in the 90s fantasized drawing dicks on split the room in two and stood six feet in front of the teacher's main desk. All five students seemed to migrate without reason to the back. We were all sitting in a makeshift circle at the back of the room, with Mrs. Pease back to the wall and the rest of us facing her. I believe that's how she set up detention so everyone was close enough to keep an eye on. Welcome to detention, the Mrs. Pelletier said, her voice dripping with disdain. Mrs. Pelletier was a young teacher, had to be in her early thirties, but she had a sense of discipline, but wasn't too strict, and knew that some kids required more time with learning. Overall, if Mrs. Pelletier had a grade as a teacher, it would be a solid B. You are here because you have shown a complete lack of respect for the rules and expectations of this school, and or have fallen behind because of tardiness or simply not studying. But let me make one thing clear. This is your chance to turn things around. If you can sit here and behave for the next three hours and allow me to teach, I will consider allowing today to go as extra credit. If not, you can expect even stricter consequences in the future and even a drop in letter grade. The students nodded, their eyes fixed on the teacher as she continued to lecture them on the importance of following the rules. But as the minutes ticked by and the detention dragged on, it became clear that this was going to be a long and uneventful Friday night. All right, guys, I'm going to start this afternoon off by take attendance. All I could think about was how everyone was already enjoying their weekend and I was stuck doing schoolwork in an empty school. Even the teachers were probably already doing whatever teachers do after school. What do teachers do after school anyway? I can't even fathom. As I went over that, though, for longer than a normal person would, Mrs. P thankfully interrupts me. Rachel Taylor? Present, Rachel replied while slouched Jay in her seat and one arm up and her other arm holding her necklace with a strange symbol on it pressed to her bottom lip. Rachel is a shy and studious freshman, all the upperclassmen seem to have a thing for. I definitely think she's cute, but both of us would rather be friends. Someone told me last year that she has had a crush on me since seventh grade, but you can never be too sure with Rachel. She does have the best taste in music for a girl our age. Bands like As I Lay Dying, Emmur, It Killed the Prom Queen. She even likes local bands Vanna and Therefore I Am. I often see her at Drifters in Nashua which is TBI's hardcore, metalcore venue some super-religious guy owns. Kinda weird, I know. I do like Rachel, but she is a little odd. Don't tell her I said that. I do think Rachel is very pretty a solid eight even, but dresses down and mostly all black. Every day. Even for me, that's too much darkness. Like, even on Spirit Week? I even wear blue and white on Spirit Week. Dakota Watson here against my will, Mrs. P., shouted Dakota sarcastically. Some of the students chuckled, most likely in hopes of keeping things not so awkward. I even found myself chuckle, but quickly remembered I despise Dakota. I hate the fucking loser. I even fought him freshman year after gym class in the locker room. No one really won because a few of his friends broke it up. I regret not swinging early in the fight. Dakota again breaks the silence with, wake me when it's over. Mrs. P. shakes her head as she crossed his name off her list. I'm willing to put money on the fact that she doesn't like him. To be honest, I wouldn't blame her. Dakota is a rebellious senior that's fairly popular. I don't know why. Maybe because girls like his curly hair. I think he looks like an idiot, but he seems to have a lot of friends, even though he's a dick to anyone that isn't a football player or a cheerleader. Everyone seems to give him a pass. Maybe because his dad is a cop. A corrupt cop, I might add. Well, I'm not sure, but someone did tell me a rumor about him in doing or selling coke. 
Dakota's the typical jock that peaks in high school, which I'm assuming is following right in his father's footsteps. I never liked the kid, and I never liked his dad. Chris Adams. Here, Chris replied. Chris is the most normal junior of all of us. Good kid. Polite for the most part, and usually behaves well in school. I think the only reason he's here is because for some reason he's missed so much school the past few weeks. I haven't seen him. I'm pretty close with Chris, but this is the first time I've seen him in weeks. We don't share any of the same classes, but I'd have to say I'm closer to him and Rachel than anyone else here. Victoria Renee. Hi, Mrs. P! shouted Victoria. I wish I was close with Victoria, and so would any straight guy my age. Victoria was one of the most popular girls in school. Tall, long brown hair. She was in my class as well. Tenth grade. Every guy would tell you Victoria was hands down the most attractive person in town, let alone most attractive girl in school. She was breathtaking and had a personality that didn't jive with the stereotypical pretty high school girl. She was different. Believe me when I tell you she lights up every room she walks in. Even this half-lit one. It seems like Victoria is friends and 99% of the time so sweet to everyone. She often gets in trouble for talking in class because everyone knows her, but she's a good student, I'm pretty sure. I'm assuming she's here with us misfits because of tardiness or something dumb. She really doesn't belong here. I've always had a crush on Victoria, but never had the courage to even make eye contact with her. She was too perfect. Lastly, there's me. Curtis Alexander. I'm here, I replied lazily. My name's Curtis. Obviously. I grew up in New Hampshire my entire life and for the most part keep to myself. I live a typical life of a kid with minimal friends in high school, but I still try to be nice to everyone. I do my best, even though it seems like the assholes get all the girls. I've been contemplating trying it, but it's so out of my comfort zone. Unless it's Dakota. Cause fuck Dakota. I knew detention was going to drag on forever. At least Victoria was here. Which was honestly shocking. I figured if I got bored enough I can write song lyrics for my band or fantasize about talking to V. I'd never actually work up the courage to and there's no scenario I could make up which she would have to speak to me. Anyway, all of Victoria's friends call her V, even some of the teachers. Oh yeah, by the way I forgot. Not that it matters, but I'm in a band. We're called Endemic in Pain. Forgettable name I know. We've thought about changing it. I play guitar and you'd think that it would help with talking to girls, but I don't even think three people in this entire school have heard my music, besides my bandmates themselves and my best friend Gordon. Gordon is usually in my position right now, rotting at a desk in detention on a Friday afternoon, but he's managed to stay out of trouble all week and is probably already getting off the bus and playing the new Madden that just came out. Gordon is great, though. He's been my friend since Mrs. T's second grade class. That's where we met. Couldn't tell you when it happened, but it was fate. We're both into the same stuff. Sports, music, and girls. He's better at sports than I'll ever be, but I think he'd say the same thing about me in regards to guitar. If I had a cell phone, I'd be texting Gordon how miserable I am. But unfortunately, I'm like the only 16-year-old without a phone. An hour and four minutes in, and I swear I've written enough song lyrics for a full record. I started getting restless, and I think everyone else was, too. I saw the clock hands hit every other minute. Time goes by so slow in detention on a Friday when all of your classmates are probably partying or playing video games. The detention room was silent for the most part, much to Mrs. P's delight. I could bet everything I owned that not one of those minutes Victoria even contemplated making any kind of eye contact with me. Not to be weird or anything, but trust me, I would have noticed. An hour in, and Dakota looked up from doodling on the extra credit Mrs. P handed out after attendance, and asked, How many teachers stay this late? Mrs. P replied shockingly, probably due to the boredom she was even suffering from. There's only a couple of teachers and a custodian here on a Friday. Dakota asked, Can I need to go to the bathroom? Mrs. P looked a little suspicious, but responded, As long as you don't wander the halls and come straight back. Dakota pushed back his chair aggressively. Scraping the tile stood up and started walking towards the door as Mrs. P interrupted him and said, Just because it's almost 6 p.m. at night, you still need a hall pass. Dakota rolling his eyes signaled for Mrs. P to throw the pass to him like an NFL wide receiver, which Mrs. P refused and said unamused, Come grab it. 
Dakota, then scampered out the door and down the hall. A feeling of relief comes over me whenever that punk leaves the room, I swear. As soon as Dakota left, Rachel and Chris started whispering amongst each other. I wasn't really paying attention on purpose, but it was kind of hard not to. I overheard them talking about something a freshman said they saw in the photography room earlier that day. Something about a poltergeist. That made me suddenly force my way into the conversation with no objection from Rachel or Chris. Wait, what happened? I asked with a sincere amount of curiosity. Yeah, some kid in first period was developing photos for a project when he said he felt like he was scratched on the neck and his photos apparently came out strange. Even more interested, I asked, strange how? Rachel shrugged her shoulders and looked over at Chris as if to keep him engaged in the conversation, said, I don't know, but it must have been something because that entire class got moved to the auditorium and police showed up. I sat back and looked at Mrs. P for confirmation. You guys are supposed to be silent. Then out of nowhere, Victoria asked, Is the freshman okay? Mrs. P clearly felt the urge to answer, but with hesitation, and said, I believe so. Soon after Dakota, the douche walked in with a disgusting amount of confidence and sat back down with a groan. Ugh, I can't wait till I get the hell out of here. Mrs. P finally had enough put her pencil through her hair that she'd been using and said, Enough. This is detention, not recess. We all went back to being quiet for about an hour. Detention is definitely the top three worst things in high school. I try to avoid it at all costs. Although it's much shorter, I can only imagine it being like prison. Only much shorter sentence, of course. I'm probably being dramatic, but you know what I mean. I'm sure. As time ticked away along with my will to do any more work. Mrs. P. finally gave up on having a study which made things a little less brutal. I noticed it was about halfway through the rest of detention. I started getting restless. I just wanted to go home. And then all of a sudden, Victoria looked at me and asked, Hey, didn't we go to the same movie theater a few weeks ago? Blown away, I started stumbling for the word, yes. She smiled and asked me, What movie did you go see? I knew she thought. I was nervous and taken back by the sole fact that she even talked to me, let alone knew I was at the same movie theater as her a few weeks prior. I didn't even know she knew I existed. A Nightmare Within My buddy Gordon has been begging me to go see it with him. What about you? What did you see? I saw a terrible romantic comedy I can't even remember the name of, to be honest. A group of my girlfriends dragged me along also. Did you at least like A Nightmare Within? I heard the camera was really shaky, and those movies always make me nauseous. I did like It Wasn't the Best, Wasn't the Worst, but I would definitely recommend it unless you can't stomach that type of thing. I responded with more charm than I thought I was capable of. Victoria ran her hand through her hair and smiled. I bet I would have enjoyed your movie. More nausea and all. While smiling in a non-flirtatious way, or so I thought, at least. I honestly couldn't believe she was engaging with me. I handled myself better than I thought I ever would, and I'm proud of myself for that fact. I think she even noticed that I was pretty easy to speak to. Do you know when someone's hard to have a conversation with? When things get awkward? Somewhat cringe? He? I can't stand that. And I try to have as little of those conversations played my life as possible. I also like to think I'm pretty quick on my feet when it comes to conversing. I just choose not to do it with most people. But with Victoria, I've literally daydreamed about this. Not knowing if I should keep the conversation going or not, I let a few seconds go by and said, So why are you here? She giggled and said I got in trouble in Miss Bosch's poetry class. Miss Bossy teaches language arts and poetry here at Milford High. Damn, Miss Bosch can be pretty ruthless. Victoria's eyes never left mine while I spoke and it was surreal. I felt a connection and tried to keep the momentum going. How often does a guy like me land one her one genuine conversation with the prettiest girl on a Friday night? I asked her if she has plans after detention in a non-romantic way. No, tonight I think I'm just gonna go home, lay in bed on my phone, and scroll myself to sleep. I laughed. Probably louder than I should have laughed, but I legitimately thought it was funny. Sounds like a real eventful night. Victoria dipped her head down and gave me this look and said, I'm a dangerous girl on non-detention days.
I didn't know what to say, and then I heard a crackle behind my shoulder. I've heard this crackle over 1,000 times it was the intercom, so I didn't pay any mind for the first few seconds until I heard the voice of an elderly man speak, Mr. Gurney is in the building, Victoria, and I simultaneously looked at each other with confused looks. I'm sure the other classmates did the same as I heard Dakota mock the intercom voice by repeating, Mr. Gurney is in the building. That's when I heard Mrs. P. gasp that came across somewhat frightened. This completely drew my attention away from Victoria, and I then saw Mrs. P. get up just as fast as Dakota did for the bathroom, if not faster, and lock both the doors that the classroom had. The detention room was located on the second floor of a two-story school, and I saw Mrs. P. quickly close and lock the windows. She, then with a sense of urgency that I will never forget, looked at us and said, Get in the corner. Do not make a fucking sound. We all just sat there for a few seconds, confused. I heard Chris ask what we were all thinking, why? And Mrs. P replied, For the love of Jesus Christ, get in the corner and don't make a sound. Now we are in danger. At that point, we knew something was wrong. I saw Rachel's hands cover her mouth showing fear. Chris's eyes turned wide. Dakota was the first to move into the corner and sat on the floor, which was furthest from the first door of the main hallway. And then I felt something on my right shoulder. I went from fear to butterflies in the matter of a second. It was Victoria, she whispered. Curtis, what the fuck does Mr. Gurney is in the building mean? I don't know if I was more shocked at the situation or the fact that I heard her curse. My eyes slowly wander the room as I replied, I don't know, but I promise it's nothing good. I've never seen Mrs. P act in such worry and such fear. I saw her run to her desk and take out construction paper and scotch tape and ran over to each door covering the windows. For me, it wasn't even about the way she voiced the potential danger we were facing. It was the way she was taping the windows. Entire body was shaking. She could barely clip the tape and the paper hung on the windows as crooked as Dakota's cop, Daddy. I whispered, Mrs. P., do you need help? And she didn't respond. Credit to her, she quickly had all doors covered locked and kids in the corner. And then when I thought maybe this was just a drill, she flipped over each desk that we were all sitting at in the back and cornered us as if somebody in the building was there to harm us which felt like eternity was eight minutes of us, sitting silently holding our breath and even holding in tears. I noticed even Dakota was humbled by what was happening. At this point, Victoria hasn't left my side clinging to my Oceana hoodie until Chris whispered to Mrs. P. Should we jump out the window? Dakota quickly responded for all of us and said, You can guarantee broken legs if you jump out these window. I actually agreed with him. We were only on the second floor but the fall lead to concrete and gravel and wouldn't end. Well, I knew that much. I could feel Victoria shaking to the left of me and hearing Rachel whimper from behind both of her hands. And it was at that moment I heard a knock on the window of the door. All six of us flinched, which felt familiar like when you flinch during a horror movie jump scare. I quickly compared that feeling since Victoria had just asked me about a nightmare within. Mrs. P was very suspicious of the knock. I could tell because it was the same look with more exaggeration as the look gave when Dakota asked to go to the bathroom. We then heard a familiar female voice from behind the door say, I think we're all good. Although I could tell Mrs. P had issue, trusting the voice we knew it was somebody we knew, possibly one of the teachers. Mrs. P bravely stood up, opened the door and looked down the hall first to the right, then quickly to the left, and that's when she saw Mrs. French searching for someone to give reasoning as to what had just happened. As the two teachers rushed through the court orders of the school building, the tension was rising amongst my classmates. I felt the urge to become a voice of reason, maybe even a leader. I said, while we were waiting for Mrs. P to come back, still huddled in the corner of the classroom, someone had just announced a lockdown over the intercom during off hours of school with a code that clearly set Mrs. P into high alert, to say the least. Rachel whispered, we need to find out who did this and where they are. Victoria chimed in from over my left shoulder with less tension on my hoodie as before they could have caused panic for no reason. That's when Dakota chimed in like Dakota does and said no shit, Sherlock. As I believe he started feeling jealous at the fact Victoria was attached to my hip almost literally. Shut the fuck up, Dakota, I finally said. After an awkward silence went by, fuck you, Curtis. 
That's when Chris said, you guys need to understand that now is not the time to fight. And he was right, so we both let it go. We could still hear the two teachers and their footsteps echoing in the empty corridors as they checked each classroom we were still trying to remain calm.